What's up everybody? You guys are gonna love this episode coming up with Michael Schratt. Michael is an aviation historian. He is a specialist. He has been studying crash retrievals, UFO crash retrievals for 30 years. His case studies, I mean, he has folders and folders and folders. Incredible mind, so excited about this conversation. If you're not subscribed, please subscribe to the channel. We know a lot of people listening are not actually subscribed. And uh, if you're listening to us on iTunes or Spotify, please leave us a review if you enjoy the podcast on a regular basis. Um, we, anything would be great. We appreciate it. We thrive on those and uh, we're trying to spread the word. Thank you guys so much. Much love to all of you. Uh, if you're watching on Rumble or YouTube, drop a comment, like the video, share it. We appreciate you guys. Take care. According to her, which I've, it's very important, a thousand pieces came in from a crash retrieval. Oh, that's a right. Thousand pieces, a thousand okay? pieces. A thousand pieces. You can't claim they don't have the evidence. They've yeah. got the evidence. So how they had this thing set up, they had it up set up like an assembly line. When the pieces came in, there was a table and there was a man with a still camera who took photographs right. of the debris. Documenting then it moved it. to the next station where it was bagged and tagged. Mm. And then it moved to her and she cataloged it. And yeah. then they started populating all these shelvings That's with right. this ET debris and everything. And, and she she men mentioned this in the book. And she said, she basically said, um, Uncle Sam can't do anything to me once I'm in my grave. Six months later, she died. We got her testimony just in time. Wow. Now, I don't think this woman is lying no. to us. <laughs> Welcome to Far Out with Faust, everybody. I am Faust Chicho, and today I am honored and excited to be joined by the one and only Michael Schratt. Let me tell you about Michael, and in case you uh, don't recognize his name or face, what he's been up to. Right? Now, there are very few people in the field of ufology who have garnered as much respect as this man right here. His knowledge about the history of crash retrievals is got to be in the top five on this planet. Um, he's a private pilot, an aviation historian, and he's been investigating UFO encounters for over 28 years now. Between 2008 and 2009, Michael meticulously reviewed a minimum of 50,000 cases which were preserved at the CUFOS, which is the Center for UFO Studies Archives in Chicago. In an effort to maintain an important part of what he knows to be our national history, he has recreated dozens of highly credible UFO cases by the use of drawings, illustrations, and commissioned artwork. Many of these include USOs, unidentified submerged objects, and actual extraterrestrial encounters, and prehistory UFO cases, which have never seen the light of day. He's done a remarkable job with those. When you guys see some of these images, you're gonna be like, wow. Um, Michael has appeared on multiple media platforms. You've seen him, if, you, if you're, a fan like me and you've just about every important um, UFO documentary um, that is asking the right questions, you would have seen Michael speaking on and articulating what is going on very well. Um, he's been on Coast to Coast AM, History Channel, Paranormal Matrix, UFO Hunters, Fade to Black with Jimmy Church. He's been a guest speaker at all the major UFO conferences um, and uh, it's a great honor to be here in person with him. Michael, thank you so much for being here, brother. Thank you. Great to be with you. Awesome, man. Um, God, I'm so excited about ha. this interview. <laughs> um, my God, where to start? So, mm -hmm. just like looking at this and thinking, you know, I always like to speak to my skeptics right. on the off chance that they're going to give me 10 minutes to, to sway them. You know. sure. And I, and like you, I'm a fan of the history of, of the industry. And also I love to see, you know, how things appear and then magically disappear, you know, and, and look for the reasons for that. But I, I was going back and I was looking at like, you know, the, the, the Byfield Brown effect and, and electrogravitic propulsion and how that reared its head in literature and science way back in the, in the twenties, you know, um, and some of the breakthroughs they were making, and then you know you, the technologies that were being worked on, 
and, and the patents that were being filed, right? And then, you know, you 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 come back towards present day, and and in the early fifties, and I know I'm sure you can speak to this. You know, you had publications being put out, right? And those publications were naturally heralding this new technology, which was being talked about um, and worked on, and of course those. <laughs> Never saw the light of day for a lot of reasons, but you know, it was. Let's see, it was um, 1955. The, who told it was George S. Trimble, who was the vice president of aviation and advanced propulsion for Glenn Martin Aircraft, which merged with Lockheed Martin in 1995. And he told the Associated Press in the year 1955 unlimited power, freedom from gravitational attraction and infinitely short travel time are now becoming feasible because he knew what was going on. And then of course, gone, it, it, it all was washed away and then never spoken about again. And so for people who are listening, you know, to this podcast, right, who still don't believe that this technology has been mastered, you know, and that has to do again with Einstein and his theories, which is very hard for people to believe. Um, can you speak a little bit to that and, and mm -hmm. how sure. we got, you know? Okay, well, I think the, the best way to start is to really look into the newspaper clippings because the newspaper clippings are gonna give us a roadmap to follow on where this all goes. And, you know, we do wanna give credit to Dr. Stephen Greer for basically acknowledging that October 1954 is when they made the breakthrough. Now, the newspaper clippings are telling us that in the mid-1950s, they were actively pursuing cracking the gravity barrier. It's all throughout these mid-1950s. So you've got universities, you've got defense contractors, all desperately trying to cr crack this gravity barrier. Now, when you look at the AMP program, when you look at the NEPA program, the Nuclear Energy for Propulsion of Aircraft program, and you look at the funding, the procurement that they were spending, by 1961 timeframe between the United States Air Force, the United States Navy, and the Atomic Energy Commission, they spent nearly a billion dollars, like from 47 to 60, a billion dollars on Atomic powered aircraft, atomic powered spacecraft, you know, electrogravitic propulsion systems were kind of like thrown in here as well. And you know they're going to get something for their money. Now you factor in the newspaper clippings, the universities, the defense contractors, and then we start looking at the eyewitness testimony on what people are telling us they're seeing. For instance, in 1947, there was what looked like the best way to describe this. Abraham Lincoln's top hat cut down the last one third, comes screaming through Snake River Canyon, a thousand miles an hour, making no sonic boom. And it had an engine pot on either side and what looked like atomic, we can't call them flames, mm. but a distortion, some type of an exhaust coming out of these things. These were not campfire flames. This is back in 47. Right. Someone made the breakthrough. They have done it. They have absolutely done it. And this is what the newspaper clippings are telling us. So there's a lot, there's a lot of evidence to support that. And, and that was in 47. That was in 47. Yeah. So, so it's just hard for me to, to empathize with people who can't imagine a world where this has been, you know, reproduced and, and, and made manifest. E even as we can see, there's a paper trail. Right. That shows that it was absolutely coming out in, in you know, 75 years ago. Yeah, there's, there's two trains of thought. So you've got the conventional technology going from A to B. And this is what we've seen, this lineage of technology. You've got December 17th, 1903, Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. And then we go to October 14th, 1947. We've got X1 Bell 1 with Chuck Yeager. And you see this progression of technology. And that's all white world technology that's above board. Mm -hmm. But when you start getting into the black world, when you start talking about unacknowledged special access programs, black programs, they have no congressional oversight, they have no public scrutiny. Now you see that there's been this offshoot. 
the train track has taken a diversion and what you see at your local air show is just the way of the dodo bird. It's the way of the dodo bird. It's completely obsolete technology. So what that means is, is that when you go to your local air show or you look out your living room window, everything you, you see there is a construct. It's not even real because what they know and what they've been trying to conceal for all these decades is they know that the propulsion systems associated with these vehicles would doom the industries. We're talking about a multi-trillion dollar industry, okay? So if you, for some reason, let all this technology out, then you would take out the internal combustion engines overnight. You would take out the coal fire plants. You would take out the nuclear power plants. You would take out the uh, wind generation, solar, all obsolete overnight if you let this technology out, and they can't do it. And so we're all living in this matrix <laughs> that we can't get out of because there's some rogue group within the military industrial complex that has got a chain hold on this technology. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and the effects of this stranglehold right. are apparent everywhere you look. Oh yes, you know, I mean, we, we, across the board. Across the board, and it's like, you know, that's why I think the lost century is a great name for, for what has happened. I'm glad you mentioned that because Gordon Cooper Mercury 7 astronaut Gordon Cooper, uh, before he passed away, he spoke to a good friend who was Daryl Nicholas. These two were friends the last you know, couple of years of Gordon Cooper's life. He basically told Daryl that we are, quote, 100 years behind where we should be right now. I mean, we're still pounding nails into square boards to make houses, and we're using tankers to you know, go across the seas that take months and everything. This is all. This is all a dumb deal. It's over. It's over. Liquid rockets, solid rockets. It's obsolete. Cool. It really is a construct, and this is what's reflected by Gordon Cooper. We're a hundred years behind where we should be. It's true. Absolutely true. I remember during um, the lockdowns in New York City, they had a. There was a. Literally, everyone was, you know, losing their mind being shut in, and they the, at the Kennedy Center they had a, a, a rocket. Bomb. And it was, they made a big deal of it and they put it on TV and I was with some of my sons and they were watching it and, and, I, and I turned to my eldest who was, has an ear for all this stuff and I said, see what you're, 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 you're looking at an antique show, right? That's a good way to put it. I know. I said, I'm going to use it. I'm going to write you a check for that. And one. <laughs> it's all yours, brother. Um, <laughs> I like that you one. Know, I was like, this is, you might as well be looking at an old steam railroad mm -hmm. Bur burst now, you know, they're feeding it so he can keep steam rolling. It's just, it's, I was like, this, there's, this is nothing but a distraction. You know, this technology, it's, it's older than you, much older than you. Just look at the F1 engines on the Saturn V booster. You've got 7,700,000 pounds of static thrust. And on the F1 engines, you've got turbo pumps and you've got valves and you've got pipes and you've got cylinders, you've got single point failures. If any one of those things goes down, you're going to lose that rocket and you're going to lose the crew too. Uh, you know, the Challenger astronauts, were they briefed on this technology? No, they weren't. Was was Neil Armstrong briefed about technology that was light years ahead of what he was involved in? He wasn't briefed on it. Maybe he was, you never know, but I don't think so. Yeah. And why are we risking our astronauts' lives on this obsolete technology when in the black world, They've done away with rockets for 50, 60, could be 70 years. Yeah, and they and they can go to and from with no fanfare at all. I mean, it would change everything. It would change everything. And uh, it's just it's mind boggling to me. And then, you know, you look out and, you, and they have the, as, as the, we, we know that the world continues to be, um, you know, obliterated in a lot of ways due to, to the pollutants and the plastics. That mm -hmm. come. Of course, the plastics are subsidized to the oil industry. It's just another aspect of their tentacle stronghold. And um, and it's all for naught, you know, and the same people who are, you know, you've got to wonder who knows what, because they're claiming, you know, you have to stop using your stove and you, you know, stop driving the car, switch to electric, which of course is older technology in the gasoline vehicle. Um, and meanwhile, they're just going to sit on this technology. It's just, it's unbelievable. Um, it, it blows my mind every time I try to wrap my mind around it. But, um, 
you know, and there's a lot of evidence and patents that you can go back if you have any doubt that this technology is. You know, I always thought about this. I don't, I don't know if you ever were made aware of this, but you know, in, in June 11th of 1985, Ronald Reagan wrote his diary. He wrote, lunch with five top scientists today. It was fascinating. Space truly is the last frontier, and some of the developments there in astronomy, etc., are like science fiction, except they are real. I learned that our shuttle capacity is such that we could orbit 300 people. Yeah. And I and I say that to people, I'm like, no, what, what? At the time, NASA had, I think, you know, 11, they could hold 11 people per shuttle, and they had um, five that were built for space flight. Um, I'm not that good at math, but I know that doesn't add up, and I know that's not what Ron Reagan was talking about in the diary. And Reagan gave exorbitant amounts of money under the guise of the Cold War and the stealth. You know, we know where the stealth money was going now. Very, very sneaky and diabolically brilliant these people are. Um, but I, I tell people, like, what do you think he meant by that? And I'm like, well, I don't know. I'm going to fucking tell you what he meant by that. You know, it was. He, it, he was giving these people so much money. I'm sure they were just like they—they they were just huge fans. They just couldn't help but throwing him a little bone. Well, even I mean? even Aviation Week Space Technology, they chimed in and they knew that basically seven years of the Black World, uh, seven years of the Reagan administration were very good to the Black World. So actually, it was '81 to '86 was the Reagan buildup, and those were just prime years because yeah. if you had a program that you were working on. And you ask for funding, you got a blank check. I mean, you got funded. You got funded. Absolutely. I, and I'm like, I can when I read this, that is so apparent to me because mm -hmm. you know clearly these guys were like, they were just throwing a bone because they were just so rolling in it. <laughs> in fact, in the Clinton administration, we were spending a hundred million dollars per day on black programs. Hundred million dollars were blown. Now a lot of those programs were born black, died black, and we'll never hear anything about it. Like some things that failed didn't work so good and they swept them under. We'll never know about those programs. Yeah, I'm sure there's a lot, but it's going to take us a long time to find out about either way. But yeah, I know that the, the, you know, the Clintons, I mean, they work directly under George Bush Sr. So, you know, it's, people are like, well, Bill Clinton tried to find out. I was like, yeah, but I'm sure the moment. He did. He was told by you know his mentor and criminal in chief George Herbert to just shut the fuck down and shut up. You know what I mean? And they were his lapdogs, and they were doing very criminal business with him. The president is a temporary employee, yeah. so they're not going to tell someone like that the deepest, darkest secrets. Because like the ace in the whole technology, the silver bullet technology, the trump card technology. Whenever you hear those terms. Now you're talking about the black world and the president, uh, senators, congressmen, people who are in the arms, House Services Committee, they're not read into these programs. They don't have a need to know. And so that's another problem we're running into. Is why can't they get this declassified? Because those people aren't briefed into these programs. How can they declassify something they've never been briefed on? Exactly. Mm -hmm. and, and up until re just recently, is the... As I understand it, even if they had been read in on it, mm -hmm. they were compelled to lie about it or risk their their livelihood and prosecution. Mm -hmm. I think that's part of the 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 you know Dr. Greer worked very hard um, with members of Congress to get that law changed so that people who did work on these programs and were read in can come forward right. without legal that's at correct. least legal repercussions. That's correct. Um, but before that, as I as I understand it, and I learned this, you know, about a year ago, like no, no, they, they had to lie. So even if you if they did know, they would have been compelled to lie by these programs, which is just so much for being under oath. You know, it's like well, who's the oath to again? Um, your work is amazing, Michael, and uh, I, you know, Michael compiled a a, a book which we're going to get into called uh, Dark Files, um, and it's. Uh, uh, it's a history book. Let's just call it that for now. We're going to return to it, but okay. you know, I want I want to go over a few things. People have general knowledge about Roswell, and I know it's been talked about um, kind of ad nauseum. But 
they don't, but people hear rumors and they don't, they, they don't understand a lot of the details. They don't understand that Roswell was more of a culmination, you know, and a series of, of crashes than it was, you know, the defining moment. It's just kind of the moment things spilled over into the public because they couldn't squash the headlines in time for that first, you know, <laughs> that first front page. They did the next day, of course, people were like, oh, don't worry about it. Um, but you have a lot of um, knowledge about, about this. Um, and I think now, people are starting to realize maybe there was something to that, even skeptical people, something. Um, then again, we live in a time where flat earth population is on the rise, so I don't know, maybe that statement is, maybe I'm overestimating people. But, um, you know, there are actually four sites, right? And, and maybe you can elaborate on this, because I'd like to talk about Wright Field, okay. you know, in Ohio, and, and fascinating story of, Military witnesses like, like the incredible Black Mac McGruder, right? Absolutely. And yes. Because most people have heard rumors, they don't really know how far back Area Fifty One goes. Mm -hmm. you know? um, so I was wondering if you could give us a little bit of, give us a history lesson on that. Sure. So there's a couple of lines of thought on Roswell. Okay, you've got the official line, which was just a weather balloon. And if that's true, then why do you have two teams of 50 men crisscrossing the debris field for three days and then following up with industrial vacuum cleaners? That doesn't make any sense. Why would you put the debris of a weather balloon in a B-29 and send it to Eighth Air Force, Texas? So that is kind of squelched away and, and disregarded. So then the other option is you've got the official story within the 509th bomb group, what they witnessed, what those people were talking about, which definitely has some good traction. Now there's a third option where it's more sinister, it's more dark, um, more devious, where internal elements within intelligence communities are trying to put forth certain agendas. And there's, you know, there's a case that can be made for all of these, but what we want to do is like, take a look at what the witnesses are telling us and take a look at what they're describing and how that tracks with the 519th bomb group members and people who actually handled the debris, mm -hmm. what they're talking about. Um, I know our listeners really can't see what we're gonna try to bring up here, but I thought we could go over a couple of slides sure. if that's possible. Sure. And uh, you know we can certainly talk about Russell because we always wanna have some kind of visual aids to support what we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. So let's see if we can go down and uh, let's see if we can go down to our Roswell section here. Okay, so let's move down. I want to start right here. This is what we want to start. So you were talking about the map. Mm -hmm. So let's go from current slide that puts us right here. Okay, so Roswell UFO crash retrieval map. Yeah, when you when you talk about Roswell, we're talking about more than one incident here. So if you look at, at this map here, the actual origin point of this, if you look right here, this is five nautical miles north of the debris field. This is called the touchdown site. Mm -hmm. And the touchdown site is where Lincoln La Paz and Lewis Rickett, 509 bomb group member Lewis Rickett, they discovered two things that aren't really talked about. I don't know, do you know what they are? No, tell me. Okay, yeah. so number one is fused green glass. Oh. Okay, so right right off the bat, it's it's full stop, it's not a weather balloon. <laughs> We're talking about indicative of high heat here. So yeah. that's, weather balloon is gone right there. We just solved that problem, it's out. Now the second thing they found, it's not talked about this much, but they found a seamless black box that could not I don't know if to this day if they ever opened it. About this size, maybe eight inches by six inches by five inches. Black box, seamless. I don't even think Don Schmidt knows if they were ever in the bottom of it. And you know, Don Schmidt is the, probably the number one Roswell researcher. Uh, so that's the next thing they, they discovered. Okay, so if you go, and again, this is all the evening of July 4th, 1947. So south of the touchdown site, 
you've got the debris field site and that's where we're going to talk about that later but that's where we had three types of debris we had um, <clears throat> mac brazel that's all tied into this site right here now the trajectory of the vehicle was from northwest to southeast mm -hmm. it's traveling eastbound and this is the impact site there were five bodies recovered one was still alive now there is some evidence that seven bodies were recovered, but at, at the very least, five bodies were recovered. One was still alive. Now, approximately two miles west of the impact site is something called the second body site, mm -hmm. where another two bodies were recovered. So you've got the original three over here, plus the survivor, plus the two bodies recovered here. That's kind of the outline of what we're going to be talking about here. Now, if we go to the next slide, Roswell Incident Landscape. This is what it looks like. If you went there today, it's barren. There's really no trees. Wow. It's remote by car, but it's not remote by plane. So you can see there, this whole area here is expansive. If you had debris scattered out throughout a ranch, you're gonna see it yeah. after flying over. You're, you're definitely gonna see it. So let's go to the, the, the morning of now. This would actually be the morning of the 5th. So. We've got Mac Brazel and we've got seven-year-old Timothy D. Proctor. And the, the way they rolled back then is if you were old enough to walk, you were old enough to be, ride horseback. Mm -hmm. That's how they did it. So what they discovered was a 200-foot long, or much longer than that, about a 12-foot wide gash. And they discovered three types of debris. Number one type of debris was this interesting, very thin cigarette package aluminum material that could not be cut, could not be burned, could not be dented with a 16-pound sledgehammer. That's wow. debris number one. Debris number two was this so-called memory metal where you could crinkle it up and then when you let go, it would fold out like liquid mercury and slowly settle back down on the table. That's debris number two. Debris number three was various sizes of I-beams and within the inside wall of the I-beams, there was what looked like hieroglyphic writing. Mm -hmm. This is what Jesse Marceau Jr. had described. So any one of these pieces of debris would help move this whole field forward. And I always question, if there's nothing to Roswell, then why two years after the event, did they go after Bill Brazel? And because he was at a bar and said, yeah, I collected some scraps. Well, well they had military go over there. They pulled up floorboards. They pulled, they emptied uh, grain bins. They were looking for and they recovered it but yeah. again there's nothing to roswell right all right let's go to the next slide here okay so now next day we've got the recovery of the vehicle itself and according to don schmidt this was a egg-shaped craft the size of a volkswagen approximately 13 feet across it had a low-rise dome on top there was a hole breach on the side of the craft and this was within the vicinity of a water tower and a windmill we're talking about only 150 feet away. So that's how we know where this took place. Now here you can see the survivor, and I'm gonna give you all these illustrations. Yeah. You can embed these yes, as we want to here. But we had an 18-wheeler tractor trailer little boy truck arrive on the scene. And then something interesting happened that's not talked about there much because at the time, and this is according to Don Schmidt, the 509th Bomb Group, Roswell Army Airfield, did not have a workable crane at the time. Mm -hmm. So what they did is they hired an independent contractor from downtown Roswell who drove all the way up to the debris field, to the secondary, you know, the impact site. And they loaded this thing up on an 18-wheeler tractor trailer low boy. And here's the full color illustration wow. of what that might have looked like if we were there, you know, because we want to maintain an important part of our national history. Now, Next thing, so now we're, we're looking at July 9th time frame. That's where we are. So what, whatever was out there remained out there for the night of the 4th, the 5th, the 6th, wow. the 7th, the evening of the 8th is when the retrieval operation began. Now we're at kind of the, the morning of the 9th, afternoon of the 9th, actually July 8th, 1947, 4 p.m., plus or minus 10 minutes we got it nailed down to. So we've got the craft on the 18-wheeler tractor trailer low boy truck, and you can follow the route of the convoy even today. So if you went to Roswell today, you can follow this main street yeah. all the way to the base, and that's what we're looking at right here. There were two paper boys that saw this 
convoy of vehicles with this egg-shaped craft on top that was completely covered by a tarp. There were jeeps up in front and jeeps up in back that were ushering this to the base. Uh, multiple other eyewitnesses saw this as well. Yeah. So we, this is all in Don Schmidt's book, so we've we got that pretty much uh, pinned down here. Now, the next scene is, I'm going to take you into Hangar P3, Building 84, okay. where they brought this. So, of course, this is the July 8th, 1947, Roswell Daily Record. Roswell Army Airfield captures flying saucer on ranch in Roswell region. But literally 24 hours later, Ramey says excitement is not justified. General Ramey says this is weather balloon. So within 24 hours, they changed this whole story. Okay, so now we're inside Hangar P3 Building 84, which you can go to today. Mm -hmm. if you, It's a maintenance center now. If you make the appropriate reservations with the maintenance personnel, they will take you inside this hangar and you can stand plus or minus three feet where the bodies were brought. Wow. Okay, and you, I've done it, you can do it. So I'm gonna start on the left here. So according to Glenn Dennis, Roswell Mortician, the bodies were, were small statured and he was asked about the whereabouts and logistics of transporting bodies in quote unquote child-sized caskets yeah. that could be hermetically sealed. So that's what we have over on the left. We've got the ambulance truck. Now, by this time, the first body flight already went out. This is by C-54, Pappy Henderson. It went to right field, Dayton, Ohio. Did not stop go, went right to right field, Dayton, Ohio. So this guy said, this just to make, make yep. clear, he stated what his request was. To, to, if he could procure or Correct. Could be, come here with child size, or medically sealed transportation profits. That was, he, I'm sure that's a request that one soon doesn't forget, right? He, he got two calls from, from the base. The, the first one was, do you have any child size cases? And then they called back and said, can you give us a briefing on how to medically seal bodies? And then, you know, this is, this is what he said. So it was very interesting. Now, off to the right, we've got the 18-wheeler tractor trailer little boy truck with the craft on there, and you'll notice the bodies in the foreground. And then in the back, while all this is going on, they started the construction of a wooden crate. Mm -hmm. So the concept here is once everything was pretty much buttoned up, they would take the bodies, put them in the child-sized caskets, load the caskets into the crate, and then the crate would be loaded into atomic bomb pit number one. So that's where we're going to go next here. So we've got multiple personnel who were in charge of guarding atomic bomb pit number one. Mm -hmm. And what they did is they ended up putting two perimeter screens around this bomb pit. So originally it was used for atomic bombs. So you'd have a B-29 taxi over it, and then they had a hydraulic lift where they brought it up into the bomb pit. Right. But in this case, there was a wooden crate there, and they hid two rows of blinds around it. Now, why would you do this for a weather balloon? It doesn't make any sense, right? Here's the thing, though. The, the absolute pungent stench that came out of this thing was so wow. disgusting that the wives of the members who retrieved the bodies, they had to burn their husband's clothes because they could not get the scent out. And that's talked about from beginning to end on this, that the bodies were, were left in decomposing for days. Yeah. I remember that too. Is by the time they got there, the craters already got to them. They were decomposing. It was emitting the worst stench you can imagine. And it just permeated all of the, wow. you know, two-piece military green fatigue that they might have been wearing. It's, you could not get that out. It's, it's over. You might as well just throw it out. That's what's talked about from the, from the eyewitnesses now. Again, does that sound like a weather balloon? I'm talking about something else. Yeah. And then they had MPs with rifles inside and out of each one of these rings with basically mandates to shoot to kill anyone who would breach these over a weather balloon. Yeah. Okay, so that, that's Why would you thing. put a weather balloon in the, the atomic pit? No. I mean, right, correct. Zero sense. Yeah. Okay, so now we've got B-29 straight flush over the atomic bomb pit. Now they're lifting the crate into the bomb bay, and then they're going to 8th Air Force, Fort Worth, Texas. Now, of course, Pappy Henderson already left and he went to right field, Dayton, Ohio. But in a nutshell, that is what we're talking about here. Now, 
Here is the C-54 that Happy Henderson flew, uh, very credible. His wife uh, also talked about this. They were at a supermarket checkout counter, and this is like 85, 86 time frame. And they had this whole thing about Roswell. And, uh, you know, he turned to his wife and he said, well, I guess since they're printing it now, I can talk about this. Wow. Because I'm one of the, I am the pilot <laughs> yeah. in the body to write Patterson Air Force. Wow. Space. So like, wow, okay, I guess it's true now. And so Safa was her name. And she believed her husband till the day she died. Yeah. So very good account, very good account from him. Now here's my good friend Ruby Cardea's uh, rendering of what this may have looked like. So here you can see he's monitoring the loading of, of one of the uh, yeah. one of the bodies here because you know, he's piloting command. He needs to know what's going in his plane. Right. Here, so okay now, why Wright Field, Dayton, Ohio? Wright Patterson Air Force Base because. Prior to 1947, it was Wright Field, Dayton, Ohio. It did not become Wright Patterson Air Force Base until October 1947, when the actual Air Force was a separate division. Right. So back then, when all this went down, it was still Wright Field, Dayton, Ohio. Well, they had the Foreign Technology Division there. They had the Aeromedical Lab there. So all roads lead to Rome. They could test the debris. Right. They could do a proper autopsy. And that's why... Uh, the debris and the craft was, was sent to this location. Now, we were talking about Matt Black Magruder. Yeah. This is something we want to talk about because this guy clinches it in many different ways. Yeah. Uh, now, the thing that we want to keep in mind here is he was a fantastic pilot. Yes. And this is the gentleman that taught America how to do night flying. We didn't know anything about this until he was sent to England. He learned from the Brits on how to do this, came back and then taught our pilots how to do it. And so he's very credible. He's a firsthand witness and he should be remembered for what he was involved in. Now here's a picture of the Air War College class. This is 1947, 1948. And uh, we're talking about the, the best of the best pilots of World War II. And you know, we're talking very credible pilots here. Now, they were at Montgomery Field, Alabama. This is April, 1948. Mm -hmm. And there was a call from Wright Field, Dayton, Ohio, to bring this class over to Wright Field because they wanted to get their opinion on something, right? right? They wanted to get their opinion on something. So what, what happened next is they're brought into this room and uh, two guys come out with this cardboard box and they start handing debris to these pilots. They're actually feeling the debris. They're, they're crumpling it up. They wanted to get their opinion on it. This is kind of one of these test balloons. Right. Could our best military pilots handle this new reality, or would it shock, you know, yeah. shock their paradigm world? They wanted to know. So once they saw all this debris, it was put back, back into the box, and then this guy said, "You know what, gentlemen? I got something else I want to show you." So they went down this corridor. They made a left-hand turn into this large room that had a one-way mirror, and they were shown the survivor. Wow. He was basically, he was called Squiggly. He looked like Casper the Ghost. He had emaciated arms that went down below his knees. He was about three and a half feet tall. He had oversized head, oversized eyes, slit for a mop, minute nose. They also saw the other ET bodies that were deceased corpse, but they did see the survivor. And so I ended up uh, talking to Mac, uh, Mac Black Magruder's son, Merritt Magruder. Oh, really? I did a three-hour interview with wow. him. And he said, you know what, Mike? I still have the original notes that I took with my father. I said, would it be possible to get a copy? He said, yes, he gave me the copy. <laughs> wow. So we have that as well. Now, I don't know how far you want to go into this, but we can talk about the other crash retrievals, or we can get into some historical cases, too. You're driving this, so I'll go any direction you want to go here. It, it, it boggles my mind that people still think that, you know, that Roswell was like a, a single crash incident and that people hear about body, people don't realize that, you know, we we had, what, there was three, basically three crashes on that day. Is that accurate? Well, if you look at the Leonard Stringfield cases, uh, there was more going on July 4th than meets the eye with Chess Roswell. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it really... It predates that in a lot in a, in a lot of ways, um, and there's a lot of theories on what could have happened that could have caused the series of crashes mm -hmm. during Roswell, which is a clue as to what we had been up to leading up to Roswell. I think in a lot of ways, um, but you know, 
just just so the record is clear from your research and understanding, there was a series of crashes that happened, right? Mm -hmm. um, from July 4th to July 8th, or at least the discoveries were made, you know, um, one here, one there, and one there. And then were they all taken to Ohio? No. One was taken to Texas, right? Well, all roads definitely lead to Rome, but in some cases where they went down in um, White Sands, and in, in some rare cases when these retrieval operations are, the logistics are too big, they bury them at the site. That's happened before too. Yeah. Where they actually bury them. Or they'll, the sometimes site. they'll build right mm -hmm. over them. Yes, yeah, that's happened before too. Wow. Yeah. And if you go back to the historical legacy, so you've got 119 crash retrieval cases within the Leonard Stringfield collection. If we keep pushing back the timeline, so you've got 47 Roswell. If you go back, further back in time, two more were recovered at the Battle of Los Angeles, 1942. Right. And then if we keep going back further, now we've got Cape Girardeau, this is April 20th, 1941. We had another three there. And then if we go back to 1933 in Italy with Mussolini, right. Right you know, this just keeps going back and the body count keeps going up and it keeps going further back in history. Yeah. You know? I read about Mussolini and, 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 and the, the Germans and how there was this, you know, the question is, was was it was it man-made or but at one of the reasons I read that Mussolini in all likelihood siding with Hitler wasn't just because they had a lot of fascist mm -hmm. common tendencies, but because Mussolini thought if fucking Germany is sitting on this technology, then they're bound to be able to win this fucking war, you know. Um, which of course I don't think they realized they were gonna have high technology and got killed out of there. <laughs> yeah, see that's the thing because what what they're trying to do is they're trying to exploit the advanced propulsion systems of these craft mm. and then try to benefit from the research and development associated with the weapons, potential weapon systems yeah. that they can gain from this. And that's exactly what they've done. Yeah. And when these things came down, the dirty deal that the government cut with the defense contractors is that we don't care what you need to do. You can. You can commercialize this, you can trickle down the technology, you can make billions in the commercial industry. We just want to know how these things work. Yeah. I don't care what you have to do. Just do what you need to do, profit from it. We just want to know the energy systems, the propulsion system, and how we can apply this to a weapon systems program. And that's what they've done. I mean, it's just incredible. That's uh, remarkable. That's their sole concern. <laughs> It speaks volumes. Uh, I mean, um, you know, we could talk a little bit about. I mean, just the the amount of crash retrieval cases that we have, um, yeah. and of course, you know, all of them obviously are not going to pan out and become credible. But you, you have right. a significant number, and, and you know, you have certain criteria for the cases that you choose, which I, I think is you know very wise and. and, and shows the integrity with which you go about your work. But people are like, human, why would, you know, people have a hard time wrapping their mind around the fact that um, if you're gonna come all this way and you have all this advanced technology, then how the fuck do you end up crashing into right. planet Earth, you know? Two, quite, two answers for that. Number one, a lot of these quote unquote crash retrievals are our own aircraft that have malfunctioned, something went wrong, and they're going to keep that under wraps. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, it's been said that they, they love to paint test flights of black programs with the UFO brush. They love to paint. They love they love to do that. So that's the first thing. The other thing is, is there absolutely is a rogue group within the military slash intelligence complex that are targeting, tracking, and shooting these things down for their weapons application. They are doing it. They're using the, the, the directed energy weapons that Tesla had developed uh, at least by 1875 timeframe. Mm -hmm. He had already worked out his whole concept for what he called an electric torpedo. No visible means of propulsion, no engine, no wings, no ailerons, no tail, no nothing. This thing looked like a cigar-shaped craft that could take off like a spark in a grinding. This is already planned out in 1875 by Nikola Tesla. Now, by 1914, he developed all this mm. and he was ready to sell this to the Americans. 
And so he, he proposed it. He put everything up on a silver platter, wanted to sell it to the Americans, and you know what happened? J.P. Morgan? No, I heard. They didn't want to buy it. They didn't want to buy it. They didn't want to buy it, so he went to the Germans. He uh, sold the technology to Germans. And so now you see how this whole German contingency falls into play wow. here, that there is a, a German part of this. Yeah. There absolutely is. And, you know, a lot of times you don't want to go that direction. And I don't think all the fantasies about these things are true, but there is a, a component to this. Yeah. So how did Tesla end up broke, or at least mostly broke? I mean, he was living at the plaza. He couldn't have too broke, but they said he was doing some work for him there. <laughs> I don't know how true that is. But, I, you know, we do know that he died basically with all his possessions in that room. And right. The guy was waiting for him to kill over because they were in there confiscating everything. If he sold to the Germans, did he get a bum deal? Or well, here's one thing we do know, is that when he did pass away, the United States Navy came in and they microfilmed all his briefing documents. So now you've got the Navy involved and that tracks with what we know about who's running the cover-up because yeah. it's the United States Navy in conjunction with the Atomic Energy Commission that's running the show here. Because a lot of these craft are nuclear, uh, we could talk about Cash Landrum if you want. So there, there's a portion of that here, but absolutely. And when you throw in billions of dollars in classified black budget funding over the last 70 years, you're, you're definitely going to get something for your money. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I had no idea that Tesla had been working on it. You know, Tesla is portrayed as somebody who was trying to, and then maybe he was. These things, these things don't need to be mutually exclusive. But, you know, tes Tesla as is known because people, and, and I'm sure this was, may have also been true, but not for so much his, his electric torpedoes, but for his willingness to bring this technology to, to people and, and say, look, electricity is free. It's, it's part of the planet we live on. Here you go. And they were like, no, no, no. sit down, shut up. Tesla, we, we're, we're, nothing we can't put a meter on, right? <laughs> Don't make us take you out and put you on the Titanic for a ride. Um, but but it makes sense if he was working on all those things, you know, and, and it would make sense why they didn't knock him off if he was a threat because he had he had a lot of technology that maybe they wanted. He he genuinely wanted to change the world for the better. He really did. Because yeah. he wanted to have, you know, wirelessly transmission of electrical power. And that's his was gonna power all these things. He drove a car that did not need to be plugged in. He had a real Tesla. He had a real Tesla. He had a real te the way a Tesla should be, not what we see now. But yeah, exactly. yeah he, he was someone that wanted to change the world for the better. He seemed like it. Um, he absolutely seemed like it. And and that kind of electricity is actually much cleaner and it's much less intrusive on human biology. So, you know, you have a lot of people, and there's a lot of science to back this up, you know, with the, with the book The Invisible Rainbow and, and how it posits that. You know, it's due to all all this dirty wired electricity that human beings have such part of the reason why we have such health problems. I'm sure it's a combination of that and the massive amount of chemicals that we have put into our food supply and everywhere else. But it makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, um, I, I was you were fortunate enough to interview John Lear. Like, oh yeah, this incredible interview you had before his death. Now, if that name sound familiar to everyone, that's because the Learjet came from someone. <laughs> and uh, His father, Bill. His father, Bill. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, John Lear worked for the CIA. And he was a powerhouse in the UFO disclosure world. And in, in the interview that um, you spoke to him about, he talks about a secret subway under Las Vegas and yeah. access through the Luxor and the, the Bellagio. I mean, you can almost feel these things when you're at these places too. You just you know it's all tunneled and connected, but presumably this connects to Area 52, which we don't hear much about and it's not very known to people. What's what's up with Area 52? I think what John's referring to is Tonopah Test Range. So during the early 1980s, um, after F-117 um, was tested at Groom Lake, it went over to TTR and then eventually to Holloman Air Force Base, but there, there is absolutely a classified world going on at TTR, at least back then, yeah. because we may have had assets that fly with the F-117s during Desert Storm 
that share the same hangar space as the F-117, but they'll never talk about it. At the very least, we have 12 classified aircraft programs that have not been dislodged or seen the light of day from the Reagan administration, at wow. least 12 that we know of right now. Could be more, but at, at the very least 12. 12 that we paid for. That we paid for. Well, now, they exist. may have been failures, but they did exist. They did exist. Either way, we should be able to see what failed. Yeah. And if we go by Peter Merlin, who's very credible as well, you can take the amount of X planes that we hear about. So we hear about X-52 or we hear about an X-54 or something, double the number. And yeah. that's the actual number of planes. So we're, we're up to, who knows what the number is now. I was also, I think I think it might have been Michael Sal's work in one of his books and, and he lays out how there's a lot of evidence to show that those the, the stealth technology that they were they were getting ready to handle Monte Crum in the mm -hmm. early stages and then straight up through in the later years was actually you know and this is this is a trick that you when you dive into these rabbit holes you realize that they've been using for a while they they launder and funnel money into one classified program mm -hmm. and then put an umbrella over it and then really start to move all that money into the tr into the actual black ops special access programs which is you know not a fucking stealth bomber that has you know incredible capacity you know above the line but but the real technology we're doing and it's, and it's a brilliant idea and they're always changing the name just in case people are fucking catching on um and i know there's something to that because it makes way too much sense for them not to have been doing it i'm glad you mentioned that because uh, do you remember where you were January 28th, 1986? Mm -hmm. Does that ring a bell at all? Mm -hmm. I imagine I was somewhere in Pennsylvania, um, maybe playing with snow or... <laughs> no, I don't remember exactly where I was. Because that was the day Challenger exploded. Oh, it was, yeah. You probably remember where you were, who knows? Yeah, I was, uh, I was only seven. You were only seven? Well... But, but I remember hearing about it. Okay, so bottom line is, uh, when the Challenger exploded, what was interesting is concurrently around the same time frame, there was multiple Titan II booster failures. So the Air Force lost what they called their assured access to space because they have like multiple Kilo satellites, things from the NRO, the NSA, the CIA are launched as assets within their shuttle cargo bay that we don't hear about, but 85% what's going on. So when this happened, they were out of business. So there was a desperate call that went out to the contractors. And they said, we need for you to design and build for us a two-stage to orbit space plane that can be anywhere in the world in less than two hours. Because if you have a satellite asset, you have these predictable orbits. Right. People know about when a satellite's coming. So we, what we need is something that can take off from Area 51, that can be over the site, synthetic aperture radar can take the photos and bring them back in real time and this all has to happen in under two hours and so what they came up with was this two-stage to orbit space plane system called the black star where you have this large mothership that looks like an xb-70 mm -hmm. it's off-white light in color and then on the bottom of this mothership <laughs> uh, it looks like someone took an ice cream scooper to the bottom of this thing mm -hmm. and it's got this big engulfed area that's all open and there's a cavity there and that cavity is to support a parasitic aircraft that sits up inside this, mm -hmm. this bay here. So the point is that when you would take off from Area 51 you would take a certain heading maybe 325 degrees something like that you'd fly over Alaska and then you would make this left hand turn and then you would pour the coals to it and you're going Mach 12 over the northern part of Russia. Then yeah. you make a left-hand turn, now you're going down over the Middle East, and it's a hot area, so you pull the coals to it again, you're Mach 8, Mach 12, you're over there. And then you get to like Australia, make a left-hand turn, now you're going over, you eventually make it to Hawaii, and then you kind of book your way home, you're Mach 10, Mach 12. And this all takes place in under you know, two hours or something. Yeah. And so what this is, is this is according to Jim Goodall, this is a nuclear proliferation monitoring aircraft mm. and so what happened you were talking about this a little bit earlier so what what they did is 
in order to hide these programs, you rob Peter to pay Paul. So if you have an A12 Avenger 2 program that quote unquote failed, and we dumped $5 billion into that, but some of that money was funneled over to the Black Star program. So what they did, and this is according to Bill Scott, when they were working on the Black Star program in order to hide the funding, they were told to quote, charge time to the A12 Avenger 2 program. And that's how they kept this under wraps. Wow. And this is one of those classified silver bullets procured under the Reagan administration that has never seen the light of day. Wow. Mm -hmm. It's like a, a, a sick, twisted corporate version of plausible deniability so that you can get away with it and get away with it and get away with it. You know, you can just keep... This is just one program. <laughs> We're talking about trillions of dollars have been spent on this. You know, and, and this thing, it's a lot more sinister and evil than even I want to get into yeah. because how else are you going to pay for this? Okay, if you have a black program and you have unacknowledged special access programs within this umbrella term, and if and these things are classified so high, if you're the president and you want to be read into certain programs and you ask someone who works on this program, and your your mandatory reply is to be Mr. President, no such project exists. Yeah. That's what we're talking about here. So. And you, you take that over a period of 10 years and, and billions of dollars, and now you can see how deep this is. But that's only a part of the story because the other way they're funding these programs is illegal weapons mm -hmm. and illegal drugs. And trafficking. Yes, and trafficking. It's, it's, it gets dark, but gets we, we can't deny it now. It's, it's going down that road. Mm -hmm. And what Dr. Greer has done is he has put legislation in place. We have a vehicle in place now where these legacy witnesses, and we can talk about some of the cases, mm -hmm. these, some of these legacy witnesses now can come forward without negative ramifications. And really what we're talking about here is the final curtain call on disclosure. This yeah. is the final curtain call because these legacy witnesses are dying now, yeah. 50, 60 years ago, and there's almost no one left. So if we can get to them and we can interview them subpoena them, put them in a court of law, congressional hearings, and these would be favorable witnesses. Right. These would be people that want to come forward, yeah. not hostile witnesses that don't want to help. Right. Okay. So you'd have these legacy witnesses, we could eventually make our way to their bosses and their supervisors, and then from there, we can go to the sites. Yeah. And more than likely, the debris, the body, and the craft might still be there. Yeah. And that's what it's going to take to move this forward. It is. It's going to take something akin to a smoking gun and, and people to have, at, at the very least, access in some way to it. You know, and access that can't be, although, I mean, Jesus could show up with, with it and people would be like, it's all fake. It's AI. <laughs> Everything's AI these days. I'm like, yeah, it's, it's not one thing, it's another, you know, but, but something like that really would shape things up. And then you'd have people who would buy the propaganda. Soft. It was all fake. It was all weather balloons. Um, but but this is the only way that's going to happen. And um, and I agree with you. It needs to it needs to happen. Dr. Greer has done incredible work. If you just listen to and I have this on my for, for everyone for everyone listening. If you have not subscribed to my channel, please subscribe. If you're listening and and check out Michael's YouTube channel where he is very busy and active, um, going over case by case and he loves what he does and it's a joy to listen to him go through the details and look at these incredible compilation of pictures which we're going to get into in just a few minutes but um, just a reminder please subscribe and check out michael's channel and subscribe to his as well so in a nutshell that is the roswell incident according to frank kaufman don schmidt bill mcdonald and we you know we do want to give credit to bill mcdonald because he did the legwork yeah. He did the forensic analysis of the surviving 501. This is back in 97 when it was mm. the, the 25th anniversary. He interviewed. They're all gone now. Right. There's no 509th bomb group members wow. now. That's why it's so urgent that this is a final curtain call on crash retrieval legacy witnesses. Because if we don't take the bull by the horns now, we're going to lose all this yeah. history. So this is according to Frank Kaufman, who was a 509th bomb group member. And uh, we want to give credit to these original legacy witnesses. Absolutely. And then and, and we, if we could get the, the 
remnants, the last survivors of these legacy crash retrieval groups. Right. And we start to put them with some of the newer ones. Yes. And we show how long this is going on. Right. That, then there is no court of law. There's no jury. There's no, like, the, the, the public will have to sit up because you're going to have people who, you know, who are wizened and, and clearly have, have, they're not making things up for fun. You know, mm-hmm. you're going to have that kind of stature of people, some old military people who, if they're lucid, they're going to command respect, period. Right. And then you're going to come up to some of these younger cases. Some of these guys are still traumatized from what they, what they were met with when they came upon it because they weren't supposed to see it. You know, right. and we saw some of that come out in the press conference last year with Dr. Greer, who's, you know, needs to be commended again and again for the incredible work he's doing. But that's how you blow the lid off this thing. You know, you you go back and then you get people who you just can't, you're not going to be able to question whether they're, you know, this is, they're, they're seeing things or making things up. They're, they were all there for the same stuff. It's going to go a long way to move the ball, you know, in yeah. this field. But it, it's not going to take it all the way to the finish line because what we need in this field to quote unquote land the plane, yeah. what we're going to need is we're going to need the physical evidence. Yeah. Nothing less than the physical evidence is going to convince the American public and the world. And you can get old timer right. military World War II guys up there and, and give testimony, and that's very valid. That's very important. It's going to be significant, but it won't be enough to push it all the way through until we can get to the bodies, the debris, and the craft. Once we get that, then it's game over. What it, what it might do if it gets the attention that it deserves is inspire one of one of those people because you know like we said yes. we know that some somebody somewhere right. is sitting on something and they're rightfully scared to to, to tell anyone about mm-hmm. i would be too i would you know but when you have something in your possession that you that you know is not from this planet you just know you know because of your grandfather who gave it to you right uh that might inspire them to attempt to come forward in a way god willing they might be able to find an avenue particularly if they approach the right people you know um we could we could hope for that but but an event like this would be a strong catalyst you know and it would be so helpful so we gotta hope and cross our fingers that we continue to have a little bit of movement and actual progress on this we need to identify the last guys here. Yeah. Because this is really the final curtain call on disclosure. If we don't do this now, we're never going to know. And and so the, 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 the fight that's going on over subpoena power, subpoena power um, that Dr. Greer is has been referring to, the ability to, sub, to subpoena some of these people. I mean, I'm not saying you're going to get, you know, the fucking CEO of mm. one of these big companies to tell the truth about anything right i don't think they're in the habit of that <laughs> oath or not <laughs> court or not whatever but but if you had the ability to to approach some of these legacy guys and be and and give them a safe avenue to come forward right. you know subpoena or not that's what we would need you know you're not you're going to win more bees with honey in this case you know and and show them that it, there's a safe way for them to do this the other problem we're running into as well, though, is that, yes, the, the, the information lies within the hearts and minds of the witnesses, but when it comes to the hardware and the debris yeah. and the classification of the documents and photographs, a lot of that has been handed over to the defense contractors. Yeah. So now it's proprietary, and now we can't get it to, because it's in the hands of the defense contractors. The, the, the government is almost out of it. Yeah. It's the defense contractors that are really that's, keeping the secrets. That's why they want it. Yeah. You know, and, and I just yep. heard someone, I don't know what I was listening to. Maybe, 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 maybe you'll know. Uh, maybe it was you. Um, but I heard someone saying that there's a lot of talk about a lot of things being moved right now, you know, mm-hmm. that because, but because they're looking to gain the ability to, subpoena and and look into you know in a physical way these projects that we're paying for and so there's a maybe it was danny sheehan saying or maybe it was someone talking to danny in an interview i was watching uh, about the fact that 
they're shuffling things around now because they're, they're catching wind that, they're, that there may be eyes. And I'm like, well, that's fucking great. Why don't we just let them sound a bullhorn and let them know mm-hmm. we're coming, you know? Now, that, that could be the case. They, they could be moving some of their assets or they're going to leave them just where they are because yeah. they're so well established. I don't know if they would move it. Yeah. We, we know where a lot of this stuff is. Number one, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Yeah. No doubt about that. Edwards North Base Complex. McDill Air Force Base, Homestill Air Force Base. You know, we talked about Wright, Wright Patterson Air Force Base, uh, Eglin Air Force Base. In fact, Mac Black Magruder made a, a particular statement. He said that everyone thinks that the bodies are at Wright Patterson Air Force Base, but they are not. They are in deep underground storage facilities at Eglin Air Force Base. Mm. So if we could get a team to go there legally, and had the claws to do it, yeah. we might be able to find something. Yeah, yep. Maybe we need some serious claws, some serious bolt, cu- bolt cutters. <laughs> um, didn't wasn't Black Mac Gruder involved in a? Was he involved in a chase or something that that went down? I thought I thought not sure. sure, not sure. I'll have to check. I thought I did a video about him chasing something. Um, anyway, that's neither here nor there. Um, Incredible guy, though, Black Mac, you know. Um, so let's talk a little bit about your book, brother, because okay. um, Dark Files, um, and we're gonna, we'll be able to show this on the screen, but for everyone who's listening, um, Michael has compiled um, a history book. So, I mean, yep. and, and it is a, a pictorial history of lost, forgotten, and obscure UFO encounters. And you have, you have um, awesome criteria mm-hmm. for the cases that you right. choose which lends a, an awesome amount of integrity to this book. And, and when you see this book, you're, you know, you're just, you're really brought right into these instances. And, and so what I'm looking at, you know, is, is a report about an armor plated flying machine yeah. in July of 1868 in Chile. Right. And on the bottom of the page, you see this incredible, um, almost scaled and it, and it kind of resembles uh, a stealth, right? I mean, flying wing configuration. Flying wing configuration. That would that would be the the technical term, I'm assuming. And you, there's an exhaust, so I'm assuming there was some kind of an exhaust report. We right? believe so, but this is going back some time now. We, you know, all we can go by is sketches and testimony from the witnesses. Right. So. July 1868, villagers in uh, Capiago, Chile were frightened by a giant armor-plated machine. That's That was in quotes. Covered with what looked to be steel scales, whose twin searchlight eyes, in quotation marks, stabbed down brilliantly. And you have this awesome picture <laughs> to showcase this badass thing. <laughs> um, and and this, that's page four, right? And it, and it goes through in a chronological way. And you start to kind of get an idea of where some of our, 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 our movies and our pop culture may have come from or been inspired by with some of these flying machines that were reported by multiple witnesses. This next one is an 1897 mystery airship wave. That's what it was called for lack of a better term, but this was reported on, on more than one occasion, right? I mean, it's absolutely all over. It's, it's, it's remarkable. And these, these pictures, you know, you're, it's, it's like when you go to a museum and, and you see this incredible detailed Mm -hmm. portrait, of a certain time in a certain place and it, and the impression it leaves on you you know i was in germany and i was looking at these incredible oil paintings that came out of the 30s of w- when everything was going well it was the 30 but it was the weisen um what do you call it the weisenheimer republic when everything was going to shit and they were all doing drugs and the economy was tanking and and the pictures the oil paintings reflect this kind of debauchery and, and, and degradation that was going on in society. And they leave such an impression on you um, because it gives you a, a window into that time. And these pictures I, I, are, are just as exciting and, and they leave such an impression on you when you see them because um, they look like real photographs. Yeah. So it's just so cool the way you have meticulously brought these to life and I, and um, and the accounts, you know, that, that are cited in there, it just, it, it's, 
it's important and incredible work. So everyone, you know, if the, if you're interested in, if you're listening, I'm 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 guessing you might be. Um, <laughs> Dark Files, and it's on Amazon. It's an incredible book that Michael has put together. You know, and we've we've gone through some cases, and maybe we'll go through a, a few more. Um, and then we also talked a little bit about John Lear and the mm -hmm. the underground subway system. Um, and uh, you had a, you had an interesting conversation with him as well. Sure. And John Lear is the son. He's the son of. Of Bill Lear, of Bill, William oh. Lear, inventor of the eight-track tape set player, and inventor of the Learjet, wow. and in, and who was deeply involved in gravity research. In gravity research, that's yeah. right. And William Lear was definitely involved, and he was he was involved in the CIA as well, wasn't? I believe so. Well, John was. John was. Yeah, yeah that's John was. John was. That's mm -hmm. right. Yep. It's amazing they always get the the kids. The, it's your kids, Marty. <laughs> Something's got to be done about your kids. Um, what is your, what is your, what? So, if you had to point to one case, right? Above all cases, I mean, besides like, it just seems like there's such a plethora of them, you mm -hmm. know, but I'm sure that there's, there's one case above all that you have that is your, your, your skeptic smashing, you know, Go to you probably have more than one actually, but is there one you you want to take us through? Uh, sure. You know, I'm I'm glad you mentioned that because uh, <laughs> I happened to bring something along here. Oh, nice. Let's see what we can see what we can bring here. So this is a three ring binder, and this is one of many. Yes. You know, just to have enough firepower to to make a reply here, and how I kind of started this binder is. Going to QFO Center for UFO Studies, uh, 2457 West Peterson Avenue in Chicago. And Mark Rodiger, who's the director, of course, this was started by Jalen Hynek. And uh, he basically collected reports from all around the world. Mm -hmm. And they did absolutely have the largest collection of private uh, sources within the UFO field. And there were that many cases there. You know, multiple yeah. file cabinets. They had manila folders there. And these things were so packed you couldn't put a razor blade. Wow. You're talking about thousands and thousands of cases. So it would be a, a thing where get there on a Sunday morning, spend four hours going through cases, and then spending the last hour copying everything. Wow. And doing this for months and years, basically. Yeah. That's how I kind of got a lot of this information. And a lot of these cases had been sitting there for decades. Just Hadn't seen the light of day. And these were rough sketches, you know, very rough pencil. And I thought, you know what? Someone's got to go through these cases mm -hmm. and pick out the best ones that have a three-page report, that have a sketch or illustration, or have a flight path report. If it, if it matched that criteria, then I would copy it. And then start doing these, you know, nice AutoCAD drawings and full-color renderings. But to get to your question here, talking about one case above all others, it has to be this case right here. And this is March 23rd, 1966. And the primary eyewitness is a man named Eddie Lexon. He was an electronics instructor at Shepard Air Force Base. And he was basically driving to road in the morning. This is Temple, Oklahoma. It's about 5.05 in the morning. And, and I want to mention that this is a actual U.S. Air Force official project Blue Book report. Wow. This is not me saying it or something I heard. This is from the United States Air Force, their mm -hmm. own files. And you can track this at the National Archives. So it's about 5.05 in the morning. He's driving down the road, heading toward uh, Shepard Air Force Base. And he comes across something that's blocking the road. Hmm. And it looks all the world like a bowling pin tipped over at 90 degrees. Yeah, This thing was about 75 feet in length. I'm going to start at the forward part here. It had a bubble transparent canopy that looked like it was ripped off from a B-26 from World War II. Hmm. Aft of that bubble transparent canopy, there were two shining spotlights that were vertically downward pointing. Other two shining spotlights were going forward. Just a little bit aft of the forward spotlights were two pogo landing gear legs and then two other pogo landing gear legs near the end of the craft so mm. this thing was supporting itself like something from the apollo program that's yeah. what it kind of looked like all right now just after the forward two pogo landing gear was an air stair door that was opened up 
standing right next to this open air stair door was a man, not an alien, not an ET. Right. It was a man, a human. He was wearing two piece green military fatigues. He had a baseball cap with the bill turned up. He was shining a spotlight or flashlight at the bottom of the air stair door like he was looking for something or he was inspecting something. Right. Okay, this was a man. Now, above the air stair door, there was a stinger or spire that swept back toward the aft end of the craft that terminated in an eight inch diameter sphere, which I believe I know what that was. Now, aft of the air stair door on the starboard side of the craft, which you see here, mm. was a three and a half foot diameter porthole window divided into four equal pie segments. And then just aft of that, which is the most important thing about this entire case, written in black letters vertically were the letters TL4768 written on the side of the craft. Now, aft of that at the very end were two flight controls that look like stabilizers, but way too small to be aerodynamically effective. Right. So we're talking about something else. Now, he's watching all this. He's seeing this guy with the baseball yeah. cap and everything, and he's astounded. So he jumps out of the car. He runs back toward the trunk. He's pulling up the, the uh, trunk of the car to get his camera. He wants to take a oh, photograph no of all this. He wants to document this. I can't believe I'm seeing this. Now, when he slammed the uh, trunk Tr closed, that's when this guy said, oh, yeah. I'm being watched. So he scutters up this uh, air stair door. He closes this air stair door. And then something interesting happens. Very interesting, in fact. He hears this high-pitched drilling noise, like something starting up. Right. High-pitched drilling noise. I've got like seven other cases where this is high-pitched drilling noise. This entire craft levitates off the ground. No moving parts, no visible means of propulsion, no jets, no rockets, no engines, no thrusters, no ducted fan engines, nothing. Like antiseptically sterile, just hovering there, like 50 feet for 30 seconds retracts the gear, and then this thing proceeds to take off like a spark on a grinding wheel and makes no sonic boom back in 1966. Wow. This is before Apollo 11, before Neil Armstrong landed on the moon. They already had this technology. Now, within this report, we've got his original drawing here, and I'm going to take you to Eddie Laxon's original drawing. Is that it? This is a rough sketch. Well, well, I've got a better that. version here, but that's kind of what he had drawn. So I took his original sketch and I cleaned it up. And this is, oh, here's, here's the better drawing of it here. This is what it looks like here. Oh, wow. You can see Eddie's drawing here. Now you'll notice here, he's got some dimensions, 65, 75 feet in length and eight feet tall. If that's true, then this drawing is grossly out of scale. Mm. I'm talking about like grossly out of scale. So I spent about a day going over his drawing. Correct. Now I know what he did. I know why he did this. Okay. He ran out of room. Yeah. You know, he just ran out of room. That's all. He, he wasn't trying to make this thing look inaccurate. He just simply ran out of room. What this thing actually looks like is this right here. This is the cleaned up drawing here. Yeah. Now he also mentioned that whoever this two piece green military fatigue wearing military man was, he had what looked like naval ranking insignias on his shoulder. Hmm. So another indication of a human, a man. Yeah. In, in fact, he said, I was so close to this guy, I if I saw him this afternoon downtown, I'd recognize him. That's how close he was wow. to this guy. Now, a little bit about Eddie Laxon. Electronics technician gentleman who worked at Shepard Air Force Base. He had 5,000 hours as a pilot in command. So we're talking about a credible witness wow. here. So of course, at that point, I started digging and I got the actual Project Blue Book report here. Here's the identification number. I'm not gonna read this whole thing. There's a lot right. to this here, but let me just hit you with uh, a couple of quick sentences here. Observer spotted object. This is the index card from Project Blue Book. Observer mm -hmm. spotted object parked on highway in front of his car. Observer stopped car and got out to investigate. But as he got close to the object, a man apparently entered the object and immediately the object began to rise from the ground. And then it says in pencil lettering. So whoever was in Project Blue Book, 
back in 47 to 69, they wrote this in pencil. Noise like high-speed drill. Wow. Okay, so it's in their own documents. This is the index card. And of course, it comes with a 15-page report. I'm not going to go over all this, but you can see here, here's Eddie Laxon's original map drawing wow. of where he saw the craft. Here it is right here. There's his car. There is where the craft was parked. We have his... All the notations are here. All the paperwork, all the documentation. We've got his original sketch. Look at that. So then I started digging here, and I pulled up the newspaper clippings, okay? This is the Daily Oklahoma, March 1st, 1971, is when they, they made this paper report here. And this is Eddie Laxon. Object sighting now rude. In, in other words, he regretted even talking no, about this because okay. he had calls from all around the right. world. He was ridiculed. He was bullied. He said, you know what? I should never open my mouth. Right. What this does is it actually adds to the credibility. It doesn't detract from the credibility. Let me hit you with what he said here. This is Eddie Lexon. Quote, what I saw was definitely not from space. The man was wearing fatigues and had a cap with the bill broken up like Air Force mechanics wear, Laxon said. It had common English letters on it. Boom. It's a done deal. We got it. We've done it. You know, We've made the breakthrough. So th that is, what year was that again? This is 1966, Six, three 66. years before Neil landed at Apollo 11 Tranquility Base. Wow. So it took him, tw took him 20 years. I mean, not even because if we go if we if we go by what Ben Rich said, then even before that they had it. But That's, but but if you need, you know, highly documented proof, mm -hmm. it's right here. You know, and th this nonsense about you know, well, nobody can solve for Einstein's. You know, and 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 we were talking about this. It's just my like all all the evidence you need to understand that this has been solved and covered over and solved and covered over is there it's it's there you know and there's multiple eyewitnesses to this because he drove once this thing departed he got back into his car and drove another half mile down the road and he came across a truck driver with the uh, driver's side door open and he was standing on the running boards of the truck and eddie Lexon came over he pulled off to the side of the road and asked this guy do you need any help and he said no and I, he said well what's wrong and he said well I just saw this strange craft that was like really long. It had this exact same configuration of what Eddie just saw. So we even have wow. a truck driver to so corroborate a, his story. Wow. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's one of those ones that, uh, well, you know, I mean, they, 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 Heineck did say that, what do you say, like 95% of the cases can be explained, but 5% can't, can't. You know, he, sure. he, even, sure. even he was forced to kind of uh, cop that. But I guess five percent isn't enough for some people. <laughs> but you know, and, and I, I I read these reports about people you know who have entered ships and been aghast at the fact that the size of the ship inside doesn't right. match the size outside, and and so the, then you you get into kind of a whole different spectrum of complexity. Um, but then I remind myself that, you know, if you, if you master gravity, mm -hmm. then you master time and space. Not just space, but also time, because the, the two are inextricably linked. And so, and then I hear, you know, I, I've read different reports um, from Michael Sala, who has shared people who were testing some of these first vehicles, so to speak, mm -hmm. and how, you know, the, the first time that they made one that could move with consciousness, you know, and, and, and what the pilots experienced in, in attempting to do so and then succeeding and how for them X amount of time went by. And meanwhile, they don't, when they got out, they realized that they were nowhere near where they were. And then they found out that the time went by was completely different for, you know, and it boggles my mind because I'm like, it's the, it's the it's the human being attempting to um, use technology that you know kind of is is f for the most part be beyond us, but that we're trying to catch up to. But what 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 do you think when you when you hear about 
you know, well, it, I, I, I walked into it, but it was the size of a football field when I got in there, you know, and it's like, I, I wonder how they, what is it? What, do you have any? Well, that's of? one of the cases when the, within the Stringfield collection where we had a photographer who was based in Hawaii and he had a security clearance grade upgraded. He was joined by another photographer that were flown to Norton Air Force Base in San Bernardino, California. From there, they were put into an Air Force car hmm. and they drove about an hour and a half to a platform. Car stop, the platform drops down. They're led into this underground facility where they're escorted and debriefed in another room and told to disrobe disrobe nude and put on these medical smocks. Wow. Like they're going into a clean room. So then they're brought into this large, expansive facility where there's a crane, and by cable, it's supporting in netting a 30-foot diameter dish-shaped craft. And I've got the illustration here. We can go over it. But what they said that was described is that This thing was 30 feet in diameter on the exterior. But when they got inside, he said, quote, I could throw a football as hard as I could and still not hit the other side. Wow. So this goes back to what you were just talking about. There was some gravity distortion, optical distortion, time distortion, something that made it appear 10 times larger on the inside than it was on the outside. Now, when they were done with that, they went a little bit further into the craft and they were told to photograph the control panels Mm -hmm iconology, screens, things like that. That was a part of their job duty too. Now, when all that was done, they were told to photograph the autopsy of three deceased ET corpses. Wow. So they not only saw the craft, but the bodies, and this has all been photographed. They've already they've already got it. Wow. And just sit by. Can you imagine? I don't think the world would be in... Would there be an upheaval... I mean, there might be an upheaval mm-hmm. over the fact that we've been lied to for so long. Right. But that would be, right, you know, righteous. <laughs> because when people realize the implications of what, why we've been lied to mm-hmm. and the, the orchestrated strife on this planet and uh, like the things that we were talking about earlier, the, the, the fact that we've lost a century right. Right, and that things are bottlenecking in the way we are and we still have war and w- w- genocide over land and and resources and energy the energy crisis one after the next and and all these mechanisms of control that they have foisted on us and how they would literally be rendered basically inert maybe not overnight but over the course of a decade at least you know at most once this technology became you know commonplace right patriotism i think would also somewhat be dissolved too because we wouldn't have borders anymore if this technology got out the fact that we're being visited we've got bodies we're all just like one people now there's no divisions now because now we know the truth so maybe the governments are afraid of losing power and control of their citizens oh absolutely Mm -hmm. but but they could but you could keep it by being honest as well you know true you, you that would be a true sense of patriotism and we do look you can have borders without borders Mm -hmm. you know what i mean just just like right now (laughs) america doesn't have it so funny i was just on a cruise ship where they found out that there was a mix-up with my wife's visa okay and they wouldn't let her off the cruise ship to go into a country they're like you're illegal you shouldn't even be here and i was like in America, we'll give you a debit card and um, and put you on a bus to the near city. Make sure you have a place. I was like, God, they do things differently in other parts of the world. But my my point with that story is, well, you could have a border, and and still uh, allow people in and out. And if people have the the resources that they need, then they won't need to to stay, and they won't be able to be pushed into staying. And manipulated into moving, you know, because a lot of the immigrants, illegal immigrants coming across now are being manipulated into it by big money forces and cartels. And, and they're, you know, it's not people fleeing for political refugee reasons. It's, you know, you have fucking fighting age men from China being shipped over to cross the border for whatever reason. Probably just to sow, you know, a lot of uh, unrest in this country. But I guess they got too many men over there anyway, so they're just like... Hey, uh, go do something. But I, I, th- I think that 
we want to end up in a world where America can visit, you know, and and people in Venezuela can visit and they can come and they can go and they can be here and be there. And 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 there is no threat, you know. They're not coming to take our jobs, mm-hmm. you know. Um, I would like to live in a world where I where we could visit other free people around the world. I I, I don't feel threatened by that, but yeah, you know, there's a lot of hesitation because we know that there's a, a one world government that is trying to, you know, make its way to the head of the snake. Um, and and but they they want that for control, not for freedom. And there's a difference, yeah. you know. But people usually want to hit the brakes when they hear anything about no borders because then they think of the one world government. But I think we'll get there one day, inevitably, if if we survive. <laughs> I think you're right. It, it, it could restore confidence in our governments if this could come out. It's funny. How ironic is it that the one thing that they are yes. holding on to... Yes, it's a good point. You know, with their fucking old dead hands could be the one thing that, that salvages yeah. faith in government and makes people believe that actually... They are actually looking out or are are now trying to look out for it's I mean, it would change everything. Yes, it would. But but they but because the government is captured and owned by the by the corporate interests, you know, I mean, they they would never they'd they'd be like shooting themselves in the head. If, If government could reinstate some kind of autonomy that is free from these corporate in which hasn't been for 100 years. But that's what we need, you know. That's why there's part of me that wishes that some of these fables you hear about, you know, well, the, the white hats are winning. <laughs> Sit back and enjoy the show. I'm yeah. like, yeah, okay. Who told you that? <laughs> Who told you that? I mean, I, I enjoy a good story, but, you know, like the, some of the PSYOP movements that go on about, don't, you know, don't worry. Sit back, enjoy the show. God, 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 God always wins. I'm like, yeah, but isn't that... Wasn't that a great way to convince people not to do anything mm-hmm. <laughs> about anything? Yeah. You know, I want to believe that there's white hats, and I'm sure there are. You know, I, I always wonder how Trump even got elected. You know, our system is so rigged, and he's such a wild card. Like him or hate him, he, he won't read from their script, you know, which is why I'll, I'll prefer him over an automaton like Joe Biden, who can't read at all anymore anyway. So, um or Kamala Harris, who used to be able to read, but now can't even talk. I don't know. You know what, what happens to them when they get inside? Do the, do the MK Ultra folks just hold up the, you know, because the, the, I remember Kamala Harris, even as far back as the debates, she used to actually be able to articulate and have a conversation. And when she got into office, now she looks like a deer in headlights everywhere she goes. And she's she looks traumatized. And I'm like, maybe she got in there and realized that that wasn't Joe Biden. <laughs> I have all these ideas about all these crazy ideas about what 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 could have happened to to turn her into a kind of uh, a wide eyed ranting, inarticulate. You know, every answer is a circle into nowhere. From the well known to be cruel um, litigator that she was when she was coming into power. I don't know. Something had to happen to her. <laughs> it's crazy. It's a, uh, it's a, uh, that's a different podcast, but, but um, yeah. So, you know, we've gone over some, some incredible things and um, you know, I, I, I know that the outlook can be bleak. Sure. Um, but I do think we have a chance at it. You know, I think that, I think there's incredible minds who understand the situation, who are working right now to, at, at the very least, slide the math out to people. Right. We have a chance if we can get to the physical evidence. That's going to be the key to yeah. it. Because anything less than that, we will just be spinning our wheels. We, yeah. we need to get to that physical evidence. Because if we come, come together as a united coalition and this technology is handed to scientific community, then we have a chance. This is according to Gordon Cooper. He, he thought that the only way that disclosure would take place is this information, if it was handed to the scientific community as a united coalition, mm. coming forward as one voice that could not be 
you know, put down. Yeah. That might be the best option moving forward for disclosure. And obviously it's tied to the physical evidence. Yeah. The debris, the bodies and the craft. And if we don't have that, we're all going to be here. <laughs> this is going to be another 50 years and yeah. we're still not going to know. That's why it's imperative now that we track these people down. This yeah. is the last shot. This really is the last shot. Yeah. I mean, this has been going on for 80 years now. Yeah. And if we let any more time go by, none of us are going to be alive and see this reality. No. That's why it's imperative. We have to do this now. Track down those last remaining witnesses that could hopefully take us to the debris in the bodies. It's yeah. the only chance we've got. Point, point them out, yeah. you know. I mean, you know that they're saving them somewhere, you know, but yeah, we need, we're, we're going to need to see them. It's funny because, you know, I always remember that story Dr. Greer told about D Dwight. Was it Dwight who wanted to go in and said, and they said, no, I'm sorry, you can't go oh, in. And he Dwight said, I'll fucking come down yeah. there with the 101st right. Airborne and we'll blast her. I often imagine what will happen if we <laughs> actually, you know, got a president who utilized the army whether it was against contractors or not, you know, firefight at area 51. Yeah. I mean, okay. uh, that's the screenplay I never wrote, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> but, um, that's why I feel like conversations like this are so vital to have, you know, and, and for everyone listening, if you have not subscribed first to my channel, please hit the subscribe button. And, and Michael has a channel. He, he's very active on it. He's always going over these things. It's an incredible channel. His work is very important. Subscribe to his channel as well. Check out his book, which is available on Amazon, Dark Files. Um, the work you're doing is so important, my friend. Thanks And uh, it's, it's, it's so... I, and I asked Michael, I said, do you think you can bring one of those? And he, you should see the pile that he has of these three ring binders. I mean, just meticulous and, and uh, very important work. So, and, and I was like, can you think you can bring one? And he's like, I'll, 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 I'll bring one. <laughs> yep. I'm so glad you did, man. And I'm so glad we did this. I want to leave you with a chance. Um, you know, I've hung out with Dr. Greer under the stars and, you right. know, I've been able to witness with my own eyes, you know, the capacity for us to make contact, you know, and when that happens to you, it changes, you know, because you can, you could want to see, and you can want to believe, right? And, but then when you're sitting there, and all of a sudden you're 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 looking up at the sky at not one or two, but but three crafts, and 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 you can see them playing with you, you know. <laughs> it, it reminds you that, yeah, yeah. There not only is there something out there, but there are things out there who are trying to communicate to this race that there's more out there and that right. it's not all bad regardless of what you've been told and shown in your movies. I'm wondering if you have ever had an experience like that, um, you know, that, that it is, is similar or. Mm -hmm. I can't say I've had a experience like what you were mentioning here, but I have been out on some of these night sites mm -hmm. where you have night vision and you're looking where you can absolutely see something guaranteed. Yeah. Now can't prove it's ET, Certainly could be man-made percentages and likelihood that it is man-made, but a lot of these things make these 90-degree turns. They, yeah. you know, they double back. That still doesn't mean it's ET. It could be man-made as well. Sure. But you know, if you do go out at night at a dark sky, Arizona, New Mexico, it doesn't mm -hmm. have to be there, but and you do have these second, third generation night vision goggles, you're going to see something. Oh, yeah, yeah. There is a lot more going on than we all realize. Absolutely. And for I mean, sure. Tell people, or just get a really good telescope and train it on the moon. Mm -hmm. And then just watch the activity. I think there's a lot more activity on the moon than people would ever believe unless they, they, they put a really great telescopic camera on there. Um, God knows what's going on on the moon. I know everybody has a theory about uh, why we haven't been back. And I just think we got there and they were like, hey, next time call before you come get the right. hell out of here. Right. You know? <laughs> What the hell do you think this is? Sorry, all fool. Off you go. Um, and they said they're going to go back. But they'll just keep making reasons why we can't go back because they wouldn't be able to make the dog and pony show that they did the first time because people might be able to... The cameras are a lot better now. and You'd be able to see that there's some things going on there already. 
I mean, which was re reported by a lot of people. But I want to give you um, the last word. It, 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 if people who are like, what, you know, what, what you believe about, right. you've, you've dove into this work in a way that not many people have, if possibly maybe not, you may be the most intensely detailed when it comes to these things, but it, it had to have changed your understanding of our reality and our universe. And, and I'm wondering in what, in what way it has. Well, looking at all these cases for all these years, uh, you start seeing patterns, you start seeing common denominators within the case. And Bill Scott talks about this big puzzle that's up on a wall. And we have a couple of the corner pieces and we filled in some of the borders and everything, but we really don't have this complete mosaic. But every time we get a new case in, that relates to another case, we start building the mosaic and we can start to see this picture come into view. Now, that's what these binders are showing us here, like common denominators and cases. For example, Hudson Valley Boomerang, 82 to 89. Mm, I heard of that one, Witnesses yeah. talk about tubes, pipes, and cylinders on the bottom of the craft. They talk about low-frequency electrical humming noises. They talk about shining spotlights that were going down the Taconic State Parkway. And then you go to January 5th, 2000, Southern Illinois, where they also talked about tubes, pipes, and cylinders mm. on the bottom of the craft itself. And you're thinking, oh, wow, is there a connection between these cases? And then we hear reports of lights on the bottom of these vehicles that go off in sequence. So you have the reds, the blues, the yellows, the whites, and then it would repeat the sequence. Mm. And then we've got you know, electrical humming noise like a electrical transformer or a sewing machine that the, and you start thinking, oh, this is all coming together. This is, this is really pointing toward man-made technology. Yeah. That's what I'm seeing when you go through a lot of these cases. Now, I'm not saying by any means, am I saying that all of these are man-made? I'm not right. saying that at all, but I'm saying that there's a significant percentage that are ours. Right. And what they want you to believe is, and this goes back to Bill Scott, because he had been chasing these black aircraft for right. for years, We're talking about decades. He he got on the inside because yeah. he had people who worked at Air Force Plant 42, which is ground zero for the military industrial complex. Because, you know, we've got the multiple defense contractors there that have mm -hmm. laboratories. So they would build these things. Final assembly would be at Air Force Plant 42. Then they're brought over to the remote test site in Nevada for test flights, mm. you know. So getting back to what Bill had talked about, because he's been tracing all this. And so he he had talked about a person that he was a very good acquaintance of who was deep black inside the black world, so to speak. And he basically told Bill that whenever we had a sighting of one of our own top secret aircraft, the next day at the supermarket tabloid checkout, you'd have... Hillary Clinton has 16 space alien babies and E.T. is now uh, endorsing President Clinton. You'd have all this here. Yeah. So, you know, and, and he said, you know, he talked to this guy and said, uh, why are you guys painting? Why are you guys doing all this and putting all this into the tabloid press and everything? And he says, well, it's been working for 50 years. Why would we stop <laughs> now? That's what he basically told him. And then he said wait a minute, this is Bill. He goes, wait a minute, wait a minute, hold up, stop everything. Are you telling me that when you guys have a sighting of one of our black aircraft, you paint this with the UFO brush? And the guy turned to him and said, yes, that's yeah. exactly what we do. And then and then Bill came back and, and said, well, why are you guys doing that? And he said, to keep people like you from looking any further. Right. That's what he said. And so that's what they've done for the past 50, 60 years. They're they're covering up their own deep black programs with the UFO brush. Right. And now you can't tell who's who anymore because they're seamless. Right. You cannot tell if it's ours or there anymore because when you spend a billion dollars on a certain program and you've got no congressional oversight, yeah. you've got no public scrutiny, you're going to get something for your money. And, and they have absolutely done it. Yeah. They've absolutely done it. Going through these cases, you see time and again the same features, yeah. the same uh, hardware, the same fastener technology, the same lighting structure. Uh, one thing I've noticed in a lot of these cases, which 
I kind of try to put together the whole idea here. Now, this is Chicago O'Hare. This is not the famous O'Hare case, wow. but this is April, May 2001. I talked to the primary eyewitness directly about this. And what I'm noticing, and this is what, what we... What the fuck was this doing at O'Hare? Yeah, it was at O'Hare Airport. But what I want to mention here, though, is this is something that pops up again and again, where these witnesses are describing these spires or stingers with yeah, balls at I the end it. of them. Yeah. This comes up multiple times in these cases. So I started thinking, you know, what are these things for? Right. Every single feature on these has a reason. It's not just haphazardly yeah. put on there. Not or it's not taped on there. There's a reason. There's a form, fit, and function for everything on here. So when you start looking at high-voltage electrical equipment, Tesla coils, hmm. Van de Graaff generators, Windhurst generators, you know, things like this, they have these spires that come up and there's a ball at the end of them. And what these are is these are uh, electrical discharge spheres. And that's mm. what they're doing. They're discharging like this excess electrical voltage. Yes. And there's these high frequency electrical discharge spheres. And that's what pops up on a lot of these cases. It's just pointing toward a man-made technology. Yes. Yeah. What it's and, doing. And it's the, the earlier versions of it, you know, bef I'm sure they did away with them eventually, but you see them on a lot of the the earlier, and, and it looks like a submarine yeah. or uh, an elongated Tic Tac. Or, you know? or if you have a, a quote-unquote ET spacecraft with wings on it, why would they need wings? No, why would okay? they need wings? Even Stanton Friedman, quote unquote, said wings on an extraterrestrial spacecraft could only be for decoration. No. There, yeah. There's no reason for it. They're, they're not flying in the sense of using Bernoulli's theories of lift. Right. Where you have a, a low pressure on top, you got a higher pressure, and it's actually being sucked up. That's not what these craft are doing. No. These craft do not fly. They float and they move on an oil pathway in the sky is how they were described as. I mean, these things can go four or five miles an hour, no problem at all, just slightly, barely even moving. They're not using lift. So we're talking about a different technology here. Yeah. And then you factor in the CE2 effects that these things have. So when these things fly over, you've got engines that stall. You've got static on the ra right. radio. So you've got this electromagnetic a uh, static electrical field around the vicinity. Sometimes. It's also pointing to a man-made right. technology. So it, it's time to just call it like it is. They have made a breakthrough. They have incorporated this technology into our own aircraft. Uh, it, it's borne out by multiple witnesses yeah. all around the world. They're all describing like virtually the same identical features on these yeah. craft. These pipes and these cylinders, and it, it just keeps on popping up again and again. And what's remarkable to me is you you can but you you can also find a through line with some of these crash retrieval sites right. as particularly when you're talking about the the bodies that were recovered now you can make a case that people are you know indulging in sensationalism and they're making things up or they're trying to sell a story but when you have people consistently saying that the bodies were all, you know, much shorter than than we are. Um, we almost thought they were children. They all oddly had um, a spacesuit on that we couldn't really tell how they got it on. That's right. You know, um, many of them, you know, have very similar features. It's like, okay, how many reports do you have to read of the same thing to realize that there, there, there's a consistency there that lends validity right. to the story. It's, right. you know, if if if, if you were going to just make something up, what, why? And, and your name was Billy Joe, Billy Joe Bob, and you were from fucking Alabama. Why would you say? Why would you bother to include the detail that the little man looked like he was in a suit, and we don't know how he got it on? You know what I mean? Like it's, it's just some stuff you just can't make up, and it's it's too across the board. When so, you're when you're exactly when you're reading these cases. It's your job to determine the validity of the primary witnesses. Yeah. And when, when you actually read the cases, you can put yourself at the site and the way they describe this information, it's almost more important 
than what they're actually reporting. It's mm. it's the way they describe it, I think, is important, too. That's another way to, to look if these people are telling the truth. Yeah. And these are just military personnel. We've got cases where this office worker at the Pentagon, she went down to the lower... They have a vault at the Pentagon. Oh, below yeah. the, they absolutely have a vault there where a lot of this information is there. Mm. Probably gun camera footage by the thousands. Yeah, that's all been you know confiscated. Who knows where that is? Multiple locations. They're they're definitely going to spread out their portfolio. But getting yeah. back to this witness, this is 1952 at the Pentagon, and so she went into this lower underground vault area. Somehow she got into a room she wasn't supposed to mm. do. So she makes this 180 degree turn, and she is met with something that shocked her to her core. She sees a pickled alien in a glass jar, like a large glass jar. Within five seconds, she's grabbed by this MP, ushering out of her, you know, there immediately, wow. to, never to talk about this. Well, it eventually got to Stringfield, and, you know, he asked, would you be willing to talk about this on the record? She said, no, I can't talk about it. Yeah. You know, I, I'm not allowed it. But she, she, did, uh, she didn't provide him any more details. But why would this lady be lying? Yeah. Why would she be lying? And then fast forward to 1955 time frame where we had someone called Mrs. G who worked at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Mm. And uh, she was dying of cancer. She knew she was dying. She had about six months left to live. This is all talked about in the, in the book. And we did 3D uh, rendering and full color refined pencil sketch. So she's at Wright Patterson Air Force Base. She's working in a warehouse environment where, according to her, which I've, is very important, a thousand pieces came in from a crash retrieval. Oh, that's a right. A thousand pieces. A thousand okay? pieces. You can't claim they don't have the evidence. They've yeah. got the evidence. So, how they had this thing set up, they had it up set up like an assembly line. When the pieces came in, there was a table and there was a man with a still camera who took photographs right. of the debris Documenting then it moved it. to the next station where it was bagged and tagged mm. and then it moved to her and she cataloged it and yeah. then they started populating all these shelvings That's with right. this et debris and everything and, and she she mentioned mentioned this in the book and she said she basically said um Uncle Sam can't do anything to me once I'm in my grave. Six months later, she died. We got her testimony just in time. Wow. Now, I don't think this woman is lying no. to us. I, it's just ridiculous to think that she would be lying. Exactly. You know, you have to exactly. be... Uh, you're not even a skeptic. you got to be like hard-headed... Uh, <laughs> hard-headed denier. You know, I hate to use that word because I know they use that word strategically to, to label and categorize people, but... My friend, you have done the work, hmm. um, and it, I'm, I'm so happy that we had this conversation. And, um, you know, we should do it again in like, sure. you know, <laughs> maybe, maybe towards the end of the year. See, see where we're at. See where we're at with everything, <laughs> yeah. because there's still so much to talk about. You have so many incredible cases, um, and, I, and I'm going to continue to get more familiar with them because uh, it's, it's just it needs to be talked about. It's so important. But I'm so grateful for your time yeah. and that you made it over. Yeah. And it's thank you. It's been thank awesome, you. my friend. <laughs> yeah. Um, everyone, reminder: subscribe to Michael's YouTube channel. He goes. He he does awesome presentations. I was just on one the other day listening to him, and um, we're gonna have him back on again. We'll give it towards the end of the year and see what kind of progress we've made. But um, yeah, subscribe to my channel as well, everyone. And uh, thank you again, Michael. Thank Pre you. Appreciate mm -hmm. you, brother. Yep. Okay. Okay. See ya. Take care.